nation be our children one nation be our children one nation be our children one nation be our children community displacements 210 freeway development pre and post the following are excerpts from just one barrier freeway development and construction of modernity in Pasadena, California by John P. Lloyd. In the 1950s, Pasadena residents traveled to Los Angeles and the surrounding area by using the Pacific Electric Railway, also known as the Red Cars. Central and Northwest Pasadena thrived with a racially diverse community of working class whites, African Americans, Mexican Americans, and Japanese Americans living in single family and multi-family residences of all sizes. However, federal officials and the local Chamber of Commerce classified the area as blighted in the late 1950s, despite the beautiful houses and the thriving community who lived in them. During the 210 freeway's construction, the white residents of Southeast Pasadena rallied to keep the freeway out of their neighborhoods, leaving the Central and Northwest Pasadena residents with few options when the route plowed through their neighborhoods instead. The Pasadena Star News editor at the time, Lee M. Merriman, chaired a citizens committee on freeways that collaborated with state highway officials and the 210 freeway route. It was the belief of city officials that the freeway would solve transportation problems, but they insisted the freeway stay away from Caltech, the Pasadena Playhouse, the Tournament of Roses, and other educational and cultural sites that made the city world famous. There was no discussion about how the freeway would devastate the city's citizens of color in the Northwest and Central Districts in terms of their homes and businesses. The 210 freeway construction began in the late 1950s and continued through the 1970s. This freeway tore through a vibrant African-American business district on North Lincoln Avenue that never fully recovered. The mixed income, racially diverse community in Northwest Pasadena was also torn apart. Individuals displaced by the freeway were offered money for their homes. And however, the gap between what was paid by to residents for their homes and market rates of the times worsened the displacement. As noted by Rick Cole in his article, how a black Pasadena family's challenge to white-only real estate covenants culminated in the U.S. Supreme Court's landmark ruling, Outlawing Them Across America, published in 2021. The following are excerpts from this article. Race restrictions on property were widespread in Pasadena in 1942. In fact, 60% of the homes in the city were legally restricted to occupancy by whites, only making an exception to servants. It was not uncommon for African Americans to have Caucasians purchase homes on their behalf of these restricted covenants, such as in this case. Those covenants that were purchasing by whites for blacks was known as speculators. Lauren Miller, who was the attorney that won the Fairchild versus Reigns case, would place them or place him in front of the United States Supreme Court with co-counsel Thurgood Marshall arguing the landmark Shelley versus Kramer case that reversed racial covenants in America. The journey to that epic victory began right here in Pasadena. Public policies for years come since that time have shaped our community in so many ways. One of those ways was the Pepper Project now known as King's Villages. Pasadena's first urban renewal project was known as the Pepper Project because it was on Pepper Street. The residents of the area had resisted a project in most vigorous fashion at their command. Despite their efforts, however, the residents and businesses from Washington Boulevard to Mountain Street and from Sunset Avenue to North Raymond Avenue were moved, removed from their homes. By the late 1960s, an estimated 299 families had begun being displaced in, by urban renewal projects throughout Pasadena. 
91% of which were families of color. Black business displacement, displacement and owners. With change afoot in the city, there were many businesses and business owners who made lasting impressions in the community, and some are still around today. Do you remember Scattergoods? Hmm. Wow. Scattergood was appropriately named Organization for African American Children in Pasadena. It was founded by one woman, May Reese Johnson. May Reese Johnson was born in Atlanta. May Reese saw children of working mothers needing assistance and created a center for them. It grew into the Scattergood Club and included older children as well. Supporters raised money to buy this property at 855 North Fair Oaks and by 1948, they had a modern clubhouse on the, si on the site designed by a well-known architect, Whitney Smith. McAfee Transfer Service. The McAfee Transfer Service was owned by James McAfee. It was listed in 1924 and 1925 editions of the Pasadena Directory with an address at 1126 Sunset Avenue. Jones House Cleaning and Floor Service owned by John Jones and located at 314 West Mountain Street. Lundy Shoeshine, owned by William Lloyd Lundy on Colorado Boulevard. These are just mention of a few of the businesses that were located right here in Pasadena. McAdoo Grocery and Bakery Store, owned by Kerry McAdoo, located at 679 South Fair Oaks. The Oaks Restaurant, owned by Sammy Trubo, which was located at 20 East Orange Grove. James Woods Shoeshine and the Woods and Valentine Mortuary, which is now located at 1455 North Fair Oaks. James Woods. He operated a shoeshine standard at Union Street and Fair Oaks Avenue. Across the street from his stand was Reynolds and Eberly Mortuary having worked part-time at Reynolds and Everly, learned the business. He graduated from California College of Mortuary Science in 1926 and opened the doors of James Wood's funeral parlor on December 15, 1928. This original mortuary was located at 87 South Vernon Street, which was one of the casualties of the 210 freeway project, which was mentioned earlier. After James Wood's death in 1950, his nephew, Fred W. Valentine operated the business for the family until November 1954, in which he and his wife, Arzella J. Valentine, purchased it. In 1958, the mortuary was renamed Woods Valentine Mortuary. In 1963, Fred and Arzella built the mortuary at its current location, which is at 1455 North Farrell. The impacts of racism in the city has been felt through several institutional systems, such as in the educational system. In 1970, the United States District Court found that the Pasadena City Board of Education, as it was known at that time, evidence of racial imbalance or segregation in the student bodies and faculties of the Pasadena Unified School District at all levels, elementary schools, junior high schools, and senior high schools. That imbalance is a result of defendants' failure to carry out their announced policies of integration, policies that relate both to faculty and student assignments. In number 75164, Pasadena City Board of Education versus Spangler, the district court in 1970 in the Central District of California as a result of an action originally brought by high school students and their parents, found that the Unified School District of Pasadena was unconstitutionally segregated. The court thereupon ordered the defendant's school district officials to prepare and submit a plan for the desegregation of these public schools. At that time in history, there had never been a black teacher, administrator, or other certificated employee assigned to more affluent schools in the district east of Allen Avenue. Despite the pattern of segregation in the school system at that time, there were many excellent African-American teachers that supported their students and ensured a quality education was given to every student that crossed the classroom doors. 
Black Teachers, Social Influencers in PUSD. Mr. James Stocks, John Muir High School in the late 60s. In addition to his many accomplishments in life, James Slick Stocks was an amazing athlete who had 11 letters and six different sports at Pasadena Junior College as the school's earliest African-American athlete of note. His career path also led him to work for the United States Postal Service and ultimately as a teacher in the district, making a difference to all the student athletes he encountered. Charlene Huff Edson, Roosevelt Elementary, mid-1960s. Charlene Huff Edson attended John Muir High School and attended Pasadena City College, where she became a licensed vocational nurse. She then went on to California State University and received a Bachelor of Arts in American Studies. While nursing was a passion for her, she chose to become a teacher. Charlene worked at several schools in the Pasadena Unified School District, including Roosevelt Elementary, supporting special education students, Loma Alta, Elliott, Marshall, Pasadena High School, and her alma mater, John Muir High School. She worked as a teacher almost her entire career. Mildred McDaniel Singleton was a 1956 Olympic Games gold medalist and a Pasadena physical education teacher for three decades. Despite being one of the world's top female athletes of the 1950s, setting a world record in the high jump in 1956 Melbourne Olympics, she was a very private person who loved supporting and helping the students reach their goals. Flossie Duncan was educated in the PUSD school system. She graduated from Pasadena Junior College with an LVN credential, later attended Cal State University of Los Angeles, receiving her Bachelor and Master of Arts degrees in elementary education while working evenings and summers as an obstetrics and surgical nurse at Huntington Memorial Hospital. She started her teaching career in East Los Angeles, then transferred to Pasadena Unified School District, culminating 30 plus years as a true educator of children. Other notable teachers that made such a difference in the lives of African-American children in our community. Frances Gilroy, Washington Middle School, mid-1960s. Mrs. Green and Williams, Cleveland Elementary School, 1970s. Mrs. Lillian Jackson, John Muir High School and Washington Elementary, French, mid-1960s. Jesse Moses, John Muir High School, late 1950s, early 1960s. School closures. Lincoln Elementary, 600 Lincoln Avenue. The Abraham Lincoln Elementary School was built at its present location, Lincoln Avenue and West Peoria Street in 1895. The original building was a large two-story structure facing Lincoln Avenue. A small building for the kindergarten was in the rear. The board, having purchased a house and a lot adjoining the school site in November 1901, and having started the kindergarten class there in January 1902. But in the 1930s, it was severely damaged by an earthquake. This school survived many years before closing. It is now currently known as the Matthew Mac Robinson Post Office Building. Garfield Elementary on the South End. 95 West California Boulevard. Starting as the California Street School in 1888, Garfield Elementary was constructed at the corner of Pasadena Avenue and California Street. After the earthquake of 1933, students from the Junipero Serra District were added to the Garfield Attendance Zone and students from that area were enrolled in the Garfield School. The practice of allowing some students to transfer to adjacent schools from a neutral zone was discontinued by the Board of Education in 1954. This was about the time when African American students were in the highest numbers at this school. Several years later, Garfield Elementary was closed and is now home to the Orangewood Shopping Center, where Vons and other stores are currently located. 
creation of high schools. Pasadena High School, 2925 East Sierra Madre Boulevard. Pasadena High School saw many changes as it started to form in the late 1800s. In early 1900 and in 1903, land was purchased on Walnut between Euclid and Los Robles. Today that location is now the Plaza Las Puentes that houses the Western Hotel and many other businesses. In 1928, Pasadena High School merged with Pasadena Junior College, which supported the district's 644 plan. In June of 1960, Pasadena High School broke ground on its new campus at 2925 East Sierra Madre Boulevard and opened its doors in 1962, where it currently resides and thrives to this day. John Muir High School, 1954 transition to just a high school. The John Muir Senior High School, located at 1905 Lincoln Avenue, has had a long and varied historical development. Property on Lincoln Avenue was purchased by the elementary district for an opportunity school in 1922. And in 1926, it became the John Muir Technical High School. In 1938, the school became the west campus of the Pasadena Junior College, specializing in vocational courses not duplicated on the east campus. This continued until the United States Army took over the plan in 1943 and used it as its headquarters for the STAR Training Unit. The school plant also housed the Caltech Experimental Project from 1944 until September 1946, at which time it became known as John Muir College. The school functioned as a four-year junior college until 1954, when a change in the school district organization necessitated its use as a high school and continues to thrive until this day. Blair High School. Blair High School, located at 1201 South Marengo Avenue, opened in the mid-1960s as the district's third high school campus at a time when both Pasadena and John Muir High School campuses were seeing the highest number of student enrollment. Against a recommendation of a citizen staff advisory committee, the school district assigned high school students from the Arroyo Seco Elementary and the San Rafael Elementary attendance areas, which dramatically changed the racial makeup of the students at each of the high schools in a controlled, open district plan. Despite its beginnings, over 50 years of existence, the school has maintained an unwavering commitment to providing students with a firm, wide-ranging academic foundation on which to build a successful future. Churches were on the front line during the civil rights and desegregation movement impacting the political landscape in Pasadena. First African and Methodist Episcopal Church, the oldest black congregation, congregation of denomination in Pasadena was founded in the fall of 1887. The first building was constructed from a barn which moved to the property which was completed in 1892 and was located at 565 North Fair Oaks Avenue at the corner of Fair Oaks and Chestnut Street. During the 1960s, the state of California purchased the search church facilities for the freeway. <laughs> In 1967, under the administration of Reverend Edward P. Williams, Sr., property was purchased on North Raymond Avenue and Penn Street. In 1969, the present church building was completed and dedicated. Friendship, which was then known as Friendship Baptist Church, now known as Friendship Pasadena Church on 80 West Dayton Street. Friendship Baptist Church was founded in September 1893 and has been recognized as one of the oldest congregations in the city of Pasadena. Officially, when it was called Friendship Baptist Church, it was the first African-American Baptist church in the city for many years and had the largest membership. Throughout history, Friendship has played an important religious and civic role in Pasadena. Martin Luther King made two notable visits to Friendship Church in 1960 and again in 1965, solidifying the church's important role in the civil rights movement. On February the 28th, 1960, the Reverend Martin Luther King delivered a sermon at Friendship Baptist Church 
And during that speech, he made a call to churches to not be passive in the struggle for equality and dignity. Friendship Baptist Church, along with other churches, did not waver in that call to action. Entertainment and the arts. Pasadena's black community has been well known throughout the years, no less than a hundred to be exact, in regards to the talent of our individuals and our collective resources in Pasadena throughout the entertainment industry and the entertainment world. Let's start with Dayton Street, the Francisca Building. Dayton Street, west of Fair Oaks Avenue, was once a center of the African American community in Pasadena. Centered around Friendship Baptist Church, the Francisca Building, located at 22 through 26 West Dayton Street, was the first commercial building commissioned by an African American for occupancy by African American businesses. James T. Phillips, Sr., an attorney and real estate broker, commissioned the building, which was completed in 1923. This neighborhood was home to many entertainers and local night activities. The Red Car Link, oh boy, one of my favorites. Growing up in Pasadena, at my early years, I, I had to been four or five years old, I had an opportunity with my mother to ride the red car. I don't know where we went, but we went somewhere. But the key was that red car was a focal point of transportation for my black community in Pasadena throughout the Los Angeles area, including South Central Los Angeles and places as far as Watts. The Pasadena and Pacific Railway boosted Southern California tourism, living up to its motto, from the mountains to the sea. How many times have you heard that? The Pacific Electric Railway Company, nicknamed the Red Cars, were privately owned mass transit system in Southern California consisting of electrically powered streetcars. The Pasadena Short Line was a line of the Pasadena Pacific Electric Railway, running from 1902 to 1951, between downtown LA and downtown Pasadena, California. The route went through east side Los Angeles along the foot of the eastern San Rafael Hills to the western San Gabriel Valley. The music movement. Let's start with Preston T, otherwise known as Peppy Prince, who was born February the 26, 1909 in Pasadena and passed away December the 6th in 1985 in Altadena. He was an American jazz and rhythm and blues band leader, singer, and drummer who was active in the Los Angeles R&B scene. And during the 1903s and the 19, through the 1940s, he performed with his band, his 13 Swingsters of Club Alabama, otherwise known as Club Alabama, on Central Avenue in Los Angeles, where he was known as the Prince of Swing. Prince got his start with the Less Hype Band and the Les Hyde Band was the greatest band on the Pacific Coast back in the early 30s. Pepe had the honor of being the first Negro musician to sing from Frank Sebastian's Cotton Club in Culver City. Don Bowman and Dewey Terry, the Squires. Don and Dewey were an American rock and blues and R&B duo comprising Don Sugarcane Harris and Dewey Terry, who were both born and raised in Pasadena. In 1954, Dewey Terry was a founding member of a group called the Squires while attending John Muir High School. He was later joined by a friend, Don Bowman, who would later change his name to Harris. In 1957, the group broke up, but Don and Dewey remained together. Later, they were signed by Art Roop's Specialty Records label for the next two years and produced rock and roll. The great Bobby Hutchison. Robert Hutchison was a American jazz vibraphone and marimba player. Born in Pasadena in Los Angeles County, Hutchison's jazz education came from his older brother, Teddy, who listened to records by Art Blakely in his room with his friend. Even though the young Hutchison was surrounded by jazz, he didn't fully dive into it until he was about 12 when he was walking down a Pasadena street and heard Jackson swinging vibes blaring from a record store. 
He performed or recorded with nearly every major living major jazz musician. In 1964, at the age of 23, Hutchinson won Downbeat's critic poll as talented, deserving wider recognition on the vibes. The following year, he played with Gil Fuller's big band at the Monterey Jazz Festival and cut his recording as a leader. I personally had a chance to hear Bobby Hutchison play with the great McCoy Tyner at the Jazz Bakery years ago. Peggy Hutchison. Now, Peggy Hutchison attended Pasadena School System, was a gifted singer and actress. She recorded with Gerald Wilson's orchestra, and she was a raylet with Ray Charles, worked with Duke Ellington, and sang with Pearl Bailey on in Hello, Dolly, and the Wiz. Herbie Lewis. Herbie Lewis was born in Pasadena, California, and was an American jazz double bassist. He graduated from John Muir High School and began playing in Hollywood jazz clubs in 1960 and cut his first record called The Fox with Harold Land. Shortly after, Herbie left for the East Coast and spent the next 10 years of his life playing music and recording with many people such as Cannonball Adderley. After a decade of traveling to play with jazz groups and in many different countries, he returned to San Francisco Bay Area in California where he played and taught music. As the director of the music department at the New College of California, he founded the Jazz Studies Program for students of all ages. Reverend George Garner III. George Garner was an American vocalist and choral director. Garner received a bachelor's degree in music education at USC and became Pasadena's first African-American teacher. He was the first African American to solo at the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. He was also the first African American to lead in a production at the Pasadena Playhouse in Pasadena, California in the late 1950s. He was a music critic and arts editor for the Los Angeles Sentinel and the conductor of an interfaith chorus sponsored by the Pasadena YMCA. Arthur Duncan. To note, Arthur Duncan came from a big family. It's 11 boys and one, I think one girl. And Arthur Duncan was all over television. I can remember seeing Arthur Duncan tap dance on the Lawrence Welk show. Well, let's hear about it. Arthur Duncan is a tap dancer, known for his stint as a performer in the Lawrence Welk show from 1964 to 1982, which made him the first African-American regular on a variety television program. Born in Pasadena, California, Duncan entered show business at age 13 when he was a member of the dance quartet that performed at McKinley Junior High School in Pasadena, California. Arthur appeared in the Cotton Club in 1984, starring with Gregory Hines. He joined veteran tap dancers to form a tap in 1989, starring Hines and Sammy Davis Jr. Arthur Duncan, I believe, is still alive, and I know he's tap dancing somewhere. Now, Pasadena has had rich history, some well-known and some unknown. This part of Unsung People, we talk about some of those that made a substantial impact on our community and our way of life. Ruby McKnight Williams. Ruby McKnight Williams was a civil rights pioneer who served the NAACP Pasadena branch as president from 1959 to 1960, 1969, and into the 1970s. During her NAACP tenure, Williams took up the cause of school and housing desegregation. She also fought and won local redevelopment battles that supported the elimination of the city policies that were negatively impacting the African American community. Her work was monumental in the efforts of civil rights and change that she was awarded the President Emeritus by the Pasadena NAACP branch. Lois Bank Richards. Lois Bank Richards was the first of two children whose family lived in the diverse Northwest Pasadena neighborhoods her entire childhood. Lois started her teaching career at the Compton School District, but soon worked in the Pasadena Unified School District at Jackson and Washington Elementary Schools, where she was loved by her students. In 1979, Lois ran for a Pasadena City Director Council seat 
and obtained the majority of her district's votes. In a mandated runoff, she lost the election due to the citywide vote tally. Lois became the lead plaintiff in a lawsuit brought by her along with other dozens of organizations, including the ACLU and the NAACP. The result of these efforts led to watershed change in civic voting rules and allowed for much more diverse civic representation in Pasadena, 1982 and throughout the country. As you can see, Pasadena always has an uh, effect, not here locally, but throughout the country for some of the things that we've done. Over her 30 years of service, Lois received numerous awards, including California State Assembly Woman of the Year in 1988 and recognition from the National Head Start Association. Dolores Hickenbottom. God bless Dolores Hickenbottom, good friend of mine. Dolores Hickenbottom lived in Altadena for over 57 years, attending Pasadena City College and graduating from California State University of Los Angeles with a BA in Sociology. For over five decades, Dolores was a true leader at the forefront of every important issue in our area. Like when she led the effort to desegregate the Pasadena Unified School District, helping to educate and organize Pasadena residents, working to elect Pasadena's first African-American mayor, Loretta Thompson Glickman. She was a leader on the front line in important issues facing the African American community in Pasadena. Dolores helped raise, helped to raise the visibility of African Americans in government, encouraging more members of the community to get involved in city council meetings. I was one of them. <laughs> For her commitment and hard work, she has received the Pasadena ACP Ruby McKnight Williams Award, Congresswoman Judy Chu's Woman of the Year, in 2014, Assemblyman Chris Holden and the California Legislative Black Caucus honored Dolores at a ceremony in the state capitol as an unsung hero of the civil rights movement for her lifetime quest for equality in social, political, and educational opportunities. As she recently passed away, our hearts are heavy. Now, there are so many who have supported our community who remain unsung, but this is a, just a fraction of the complete list. Hank Wolfong, first black person to sit on the city board of directors. W.D. Edson, Lillian Mims, Father Alfred E. Norman, City Planning Commission, Earl Grant, Family Savings, Alice Bugs, The Moore Family, these unsung heroes, some that have been mentioned and some that may have not been mentioned today, are just a fabric of what the African-American experience has been in Pasadena since the inception of the Crown and Key in 1887. Let's give all praise to all those who fought in our community. Business, education, entertainment, science, and all of the above which helped make a rich fabric of the African-American experience in the city of Pasadena. Peace and blessings.